Hello. This is honestly such a blessing. I am so grateful to be here. I cannot thank all of you enough for coming here to hear me speak. Um, I want to start off by asking you guys a very simple question. By a show of hands, how many people in this room have had bad things happen to them? Everyone. Okay. Everyone. Now I'm going to ask a similar question, but it's going to be different. By a show of hands, how many people in this room consider themselves a victim? Wow. Really impressive. Normally I get a few hands and that's, that's really impressive. So the differences in these questions is a difference in mentality. I have been smeared, libeled, I have been protested, I have been kicked out of restaurants, I have been assaulted because I go around with a very simple message, which is that bad things happen to everyone, but a victim mentality is not something that you should possess because a bad thing happens to you. This has earned me the title of being called anti-black, anti-LGBT, um, I have been called a Nazi sympathizer, among other things, because I have this idea that if we don't accept ourselves as oppressed and we accept ourselves as the victor of our experiences, then we can achieve more in life. So let me tell you a little bit about me that you're not going to find um, in all of these articles that basically want people to believe that I am somehow a white supremacist, which is quite impressive that I get called a white supremacist. Um, I grew up in Stamford, Connecticut. Uh, I did not, yeah, yes, is there some Connecticut love here? That's awesome. I grew up in Stamford, Connecticut um, I, in, a, in a really small apartment I share with my sisters. I have two sisters. Um, did not grow up, I grew up in poverty. My family didn't have much. We had the exterminator coming into our apartment when I was a little girl to get rid of the roaches every week because we lived in a low income housing structure. Um, about the time that I was eight years old, my grandfather uh, decided, he came to our apartment, he said, I really don't want my grandbabies uh, to live in this sort of a situation. And he moved us into his very middle class house. Now, my grandfather is a very, very, very pious man. Living in his home meant that every single morning, um, I was meant to read the Bible. He would pick a scripture, and me and my brothers and sisters would sit around the table, and he would ask us questions, and based on our understanding of the scriptures and the Bible, we would be awarded different hot chocolate mugs in the morning. Um, I never really in my life thought that that was a meaningful way to grow up. In fact, when I was introduced to the public school system, I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed about my relationship with God. I wanted it to go away. I didn't want people to know that my grandparents were so Christian, that they wanted us to read the Bible every morning. That wasn't cool. That wasn't a cool way to live. And so I shed that. I shed that throughout most of middle school. I hid it. And in high school, I completely shed it when my grandparents moved down south. In high school, I had a very unique experience happen to me, which Reporters and journalists do not like to report on because it completely disrupts their narrative that I don't understand that bad things happen to black people, that I don't understand that there's racism in the world and that people can be hurt by racism. When I was in high school, I, was, I had a boyfriend. It was my first boyfriend. I thought I was really cool. And he and I went to watch a movie at his house. We were watching Talladega Nights. It's a great movie if you guys haven't seen it. For those of you that have seen it, I never know what to do with my hands, just like Ricky Bobby. Um, so I was watching Talladega Nights, and my phone rang, and uh, it was a blocked call, and I don't pick up blocked calls, so I sent it to voicemail. My phone rang again, I sent it to voicemail again. My phone rang four times. By the time the movie was over, I had four missed voicemails, which was really an insane thing. So I went home, and I listened to the voicemails after a great night, and what I heard was something really horrific and terrifying. On the other end of the line, there were four male voices and they were alternating. Um, they were calling me the N-word. They were saying that they were gonna put a bullet in the back of my head as they had done to Martin Luther King. Uh, they were calling me Rosa Parks. They were telling me that they were going to tar and feather my family. It went on for a, a really intense 
I would say five minutes. And when I hung up the phone, the first thing that I did was I broke down and I cried because I couldn't think of four people that would say those words to me. I couldn't even think of one person that would say those words to me. Here I am, I'm, I'm a, a senior in high school, living my best life, and I get these terrible messages. So I went to bed the next morning, I had a class, a philosophy class, and we happened to be talking about racism, and I told my teacher, I rose my hand and I told him what happened. I said, Mr. Forker, I got these terrible messages, and I played them for him, and he was so horrified that he said, get up right now, we're going to go to the principal, and you're going to report these messages. The principal immediately called the police. And that was the beginning of what would represent a very dark life, a dark period in my life. It turned out by some random stroke of my own misfortune that I did not know, as I had said, three of those people in the car. One of those three people in the car that night that left me those messages happened to be the current Democratic governor of Connecticut's son. And instantly, this case was elevated and my face, a high school senior, was splashed on the front pages of every newspaper in Connecticut and in New York calling me a victim, a victim of a hate crime. That's a really, really, really heavy word, a victim of a hate crime. It turned out that one of the kids in the car was a former friend of mine, and I used to hang out with him and a group of my friends all the time. And, and once I got a boyfriend, I did what most girls do, and I just wanted to be with my boyfriend, and he was hurt. And one night he got into a car, and he was drinking, and with three people that I didn't know, and they decided to leave me these voicemails. Now, of course, because a politician's son was involved, the FBI had to get involved to trace the origins of the messages because nobody wanted to come clean and say that they had left them. So I went from watching Talladega Nights to being a front page cover story, to being called a victim, to having everyone in my high school and in my town debate whether or not the messages were real, why the FBI investigated it. Of course the messages were real. Of course, after the FBI included their six-week-long investigation, they determined that I did, in fact, receive these messages from these men. And six weeks later, all four of them were arrested. The youngest person in that car was only 14 years old. And then, of course, after the entire world was debating it, reading letters to the editor where people either called me a liar, a hero, a victim, um, it was over, just like that. The press was over. They were ready to move on from the situation. And that seems to be a common theme. We're looking for the oppressed and the oppressor. These kids were labeled racist, I was labeled a victim. How did that turn out for me? Well, for me it turned out into four and a half years of anorexia. The next years of my life, I, that title, I was so scared going into college afraid that people that I was meeting were going to Google me and they were going to find this story, that they were going to find that I was a victim, that they were going to think that I somehow started this or I deserved it, or they were going to take a side in the same way that people in my town had taken a side. The only way that I felt that I could assert control over myself and over my narrative was through having anorexia. It took four and a half years of me having an eating disorder before something woke up in me. I was living in Manhattan, I was paying down student loans, I went to school and I majored in, quite ironically, journalism, uh, something that I don't believe in as much today. And I began to take yoga classes. And I had lived a life partying throughout college, drinking, really had fallen far from the girl that sat at the kitchen table with her grandfather reading the Bible. My friend said, let's take a yoga class. I went to yoga class and suddenly that silence, that meditation, you know, the prayer that people have, I really, for the first time in a really long time, was able to have conversations with myself. Candace, what are you doing? You know, why are you doing this? Why are you living this life? Are you happy? The answer, of course, was I was not happy. I wasn't happy being a victim. I was miserable. I was allowing it to eat me alive. I was able to meditate my way, and people say, how did you get over your anorexia? Meditation, yoga. I was able to meditate myself back into health 
with conversations and prayer and focus. And here's what I discovered. What happened to me in high school didn't just happen to me, it also happened to the four kids that left those terrible messages. Because a 14 year old, a 15 year old, a person that was my former friend, they can't be racist. That's a heavy word. That's a really heavy word. What they were, were young kids that were trying out what it was like to be mean in a generation that has smartphones, in a generation that can send text messages, can send Facebook and Instagram messages around the world in a matter of nanoseconds, something that the adults that had raised us had never experienced before in their lives. We are the LOL generation. When I was a little girl, my dad had a beeper. He didn't have Twitter, there was no Facebook, there was no Instagram, and parents and teachers never thought about how that might impact us growing up. When you no longer have to look at someone to just be mean. When you can just say a mean tweet, leave a mean comment. It's so easy in this generation to be mean. I thought to myself, wow, imagine if, as opposed to calling me a victim, which ruined four and a half years of my life, as opposed to calling children racists, which I'm sure ruined years of their lives, what if the adults in this situation tried to pause and actually understand how everybody was impacted? What if the adults tried to understand what it's like being a kid coming up in this generation, how easy it is for us to be mean? What if the politician just made his son say sorry? No one says sorry anymore. That seems to be going out of style because people are constantly trying to get away with everything. I was angry with God for a lot of things in my life. I was angry that I didn't grow up in a family that had any money. I was angry that I had $150,000 in student loan debt and no degree. I had to drop out because Sally Mae collapsed and I couldn't get my loan in my senior year. I was angry with God because I had this horrific situation happen in high school and I was a victim and he allowed that to happen to me. That was my mentality. And all of a sudden I had a different perspective and this perspective changed my life. And it's what I try to tell everybody that is going through something bad. Whether you believe it or not is up to you, but I can tell you that it transformed my life. I believe that God picks people to have experiences in their life the good ones and the bad ones. I believe that God wanted me to have my parents. I believe that my God, want, I, my God wanted me to grow up in a house that was dysfunctional. I think that he wanted me to grow up impoverished. He wanted me to go through a hate crime as it was classified in high school. Because who better positioned to attack the left's narrative than somebody who has lived through all of that. In 2017, in early 2017, I had such an interesting moment. I, I was still drinking, um, and suddenly, after a night of drinking, um, I woke up in the morning, and I just broke down crying. It was the most bizarre thing. Nothing happened. There was nothing eventful that happened. I broke down crying. And I said to someone close to me, I have this feeling, and it was the first time that I had said um, that God wanted me to do something, that God wants me to quit drinking. Just like that. I just quit drinking because I broke down crying in a room and had a, a sense that God wanted me not to poison my body anymore. That he, that he wanted to be able to open the universe up to me in a way that it had never been opened up to me. I quit drinking. And I uploaded my first YouTube video, which was called, Mom, Dad, I'm a Conservative. What happened next, I could have never predicted. My third video got 26 million views worldwide. It was me attacking the narrative that CNN was trying to sell to me after, which I'm sure you guys remember here in Virginia, the Charlottesville debacle. CNN, when I went home, was trying to sell to me as a black American that the KKK was alive and well. That a real fear that I have to have walking down the street is that a guy on horseback in a white hood is going to come because we didn't vote for Hillary Clinton. <laughs> and I said, this is ridiculous. Honestly, we've had enough of this narrative. It's time for someone to be a voice in the black community. And 
I just started ranting. I always call it, I, what I did for four and a half minutes was a Kanye rant. <laughs> I challenged Americans to believe their experiences versus what they see coming out of their TV screens. Because what I see is that I grew up, I grew up in a country that is not racist. I grew up in a country that is diverse. I grew up in a country that has given opportunities to so many people, including myself, to be able to start from humble beginnings and to use my voice and to be able to share it. And tell me in what other country in the world do people have those sorts of opportunities that they could flip open a laptop, Kanye rant for four minutes, and reach 26 million homes? I attack a lot of narratives on TV. I'm sure for those of you guys that follow me on Twitter, <laughs> you see that I'm going after, I go, I go for the jugular a lot about tons of things. I speak out against feminism because it's not feminism. What's happening today is a radical form of a woman's movement. The idea that we don't need men, that men are always and constantly, once again, the oppressed versus the oppressor. I have news for people that do identify themselves as feminists. Men are not dropped off by the stork. They are born. We are the people that have to carry men for nine months. They are our little boys, they are our sons, they are our husbands. The idea that somebody can live a life in the way that Brett Kavanaugh has lived his life and to have what has happened to him over these last couple of weeks happen to him should terrify everyone. This country needs due process, but beyond that, this country needs women to find their voices and to fight for our men, because what is happening right now is a cultural war on men. Quite controversially, I also speak out against uh, Planned Parenthood, and I know um, <laughs> in school I learned that choice was good. The word choice is good. The left is incredibly good at linguistics. Planned Parenthood. That sounds nice. I want to plan my parenthood. But in reality, they're murdering babies. Choice. Choice is good, I want choices, but in reality, one of those choices is to murder. When I looked into Planned Parenthood and the history of eugenics and the fact that it was founded by a woman who quite literally said that black people need to be exterminated like weeds. When I looked into the numbers and I understood that 900 black babies are aborted every single day, and yet CNN wants me to pay attention and be upset and enraged and to boycott and to protest for the 16 unarmed black men that are shot and killed by police per year. No voice for the 18 million black babies that have been ripped from the wombs of their parents since 1973. That's acceptable. They have branded that as okay murder. That is the focus that I try to deliver to the black community to understand that our population growth has stagnated. And it is due to the fact that we are being taught to murder our children. That has labeled me as somebody that's controversial. She doesn't believe in Planned Parenthood. I'll tell you what else I don't believe in. I don't believe in the welfare system. You know, I make strong statements and I say that I don't believe in the welfare system because look at what it has earned people that have gone on to the welfare system. Absolutely nothing. Since LBJ put in place the Great Society Act, which he referred to as the N-word bill, it has completely decimated our communities. A question that I always ask myself, and I've had this conversation with my partner, Charlie Kirk, is why is it that the left mocks God? It's a weird thing. Like, you know, there's a lot of things you can make fun of, but it's very weird when you start making fun of Jesus Christ and that becomes normal. 
when Joy Behar is just openly mocking Christians on The View, when, when they're openly mocking the fact that our Vice President Mike Pence has respect for his wife and believes in Jesus Christ. Why would they do that? The welfare system is an interesting study as to why. My belief is that the left wants to grow government. It wants government in many ways to replace God in people's lives. It wants people to turn to government for solutions, for every solution. Someone had told me that, hey, Candace, you know, the argument for, for pro-choice is that Planned Parenthood also does a lot of really great things, and I'm sure that's true. You know, they, they supply birth control pills, and um, they conduct mammograms, and women can go there for other health concerns. And I say, that's really great. But they're also murdering people. There's no justification for murdering people. How do we get to a point in society where people understand the value of a human life? If we don't have people boldly and courageously standing up and speaking out against these systems, which are meant to make us place so much faith in the government, so much faith that the government can fix all of our issues, so much faith that the government understands how many human lives are worth being born? How do we reverse that? Every single person in here, I believe, has had a series of experiences that are prompting them to do something great in this world. At the moment that you believe in yourself, at the moment that you get back to your center, that you align yourself with the universe, with God, the universe will open itself up to you. It certainly did for me. Maybe not every person is going to do what I did. Maybe not every person is going to quit their job and decide they're going to make YouTube videos. But make no mistake, there is a cultural war happening and every single one of you can do something and participate in it in some regard. My focus obviously has been on presenting a new perspective to the black community. I think we are in desperate need of new voices in the black community. We are in desperate need of somebody that will stand on a platform and say, hey, it's actually not cool to be a victim. There's no value in being a victim. You win no awards for being a victim, unless you're Colin Kaepernick. <laughs> I think he made a, he made a pretty sweet deal off of, off of being a victim, so credit to him where credit is due. Um, but the message that he is selling to people, of course, is not going to get them anywhere. At the moment that you believe that you can't, you won't. At the moment that you believe that you can, you will. Why is that controversial? Why wouldn't the left want to tell the truth about me, that I stand on a stage and I tell people all across the country that I believe in them? That's what I'm saying. Every time I stand on a stage in a room, at a university, at a college, I say, hey guys, I believe you. I believe in you. You can do it without government handouts. You can do it based off of good ideas. You can do it based off of hard work. You can do it with Jesus Christ. <laughs> of course, if every single person in the world thought that, if every single person in the world woke up with confidence and said, I can do it and I can contribute, and my life, my birth has meant something, it means something to this world, and I'm going to contribute something, you would see, naturally, <laughs> that government would shrink. That when people were faced with problems, they wouldn't run to an arbitrary welfare system. They would turn to God, they would turn to their communities, um, and they would nurse themselves back to health. That's what you would see. And that is why I believe in my heart that I have been considered a threat to the left and to the establishment. Kanye West, man, he's a wonderful man. 
it's so great to, to, to look back at everything now and to, to remember his song, Jesus Walks. How many of you guys know that song? <laughs> And he made that song, he made that hip-hop song, Jesus Walks, because people told him that he couldn't talk about Jesus, and he couldn't make Jesus cool. So he made it a a number one album. (laughs) He made it a number one track, talking about Jesus, um, and feeling that Jesus was walking with him in what he was doing. The gift of Kanye West isn't because he is one of the biggest stars in the world. The gift of Kanye West and that simple seven-word tweet that broke the internet, I love the way Candace Owens thinks, is that he opened people's hearts and people's minds to a different perspective. The gift of Kanye West putting on the MAGA hat was that it completely destroyed the narrative. I love Donald Trump. (laughs) First and foremost, he's pointedly hilarious. <laughs> I, I actually genuinely feel bad that there are people that are not enjoying Donald Trump in office. Like, I just I don't understand how they don't understand how hilarious President Donald Trump is. Aside from that, he's an unbelievably strong leader. To stand in the face of the entire United Nations assembly yesterday and to say that America will be governed by Americans and not by globalists. What is it that President Donald Trump, Kanye West, and Candace Owens have in common that we have grown so fond of each other? I think Kanye West describes it as dragon energy. (laughs) And to me, I think it's, it's individualism. It's believing in yourself. It's standing up in the face of everybody telling you you can't. You're not allowed to think that. You're a black man. You can't think that. You're not allowed to think that. You're not a woman. You have to think this because you're a woman. It's standing up in the face of all of that and saying, no, I am my own person. I am governed by what I believe to be truth. And I can live up to any expectation that I set for myself. I think that is an energy, that is a love, and that is a passion that I hope that I work every day to share with the world. Thank you.